To characterize convection problems, we first need to understand the fluid mechanics of the problem, and that requires an understanding of the equations of motion. The equations of motions are derived from Newton's first law. The form that we see below, which shows the change in momentum is equal to the sum of the forces, is resulting form following a set of particles where we always track the mass. This formulation is called a Lagrangian model or a Lagrangian formulation. We'll see that in fluid mechanics, we're more likely to try to follow a particular region of space, which is considered an Eulerian form. When we look at tracers coming from some sort of uh, gun, we understand that while it might look continuous, that this is actually discrete. If we were to follow a particular slug in time as it goes downstream, that would be considered a Lagrangian analysis, and we could formulate equations of motion tracking that particular slug, its temperature, and its properties. On the other hand, if we were to focus on a region in space and ask about all the different slugs that flow through there, that would be considered an Eulerian frame of reference. To go from a Lagrangian frame of reference to an Eulerian frame of reference requires something called Reynolds Transport Theorem. And the basic idea of Reynolds Transport Theorem will be identified and discussed uh, in this section. The first time that you probably saw something like that, somebody probably said, imagine the situation where you have a region in space that initially contains some material at times equal to zero. At some later time, you're still looking at that region in space, but there's been a flow, or there is a flow, and some of that material has flowed out of that region in space. Now, if we want to understand how the material, and so mind you that some other material has flowed in to that area that it was initially occupied at t is equal to zero by this material. So if we want to understand how things change within that control volume, that is within the dashed lines, we could ask ourselves, we say, well, the way it changes is by understanding how the stuff that came out of it, the stuff that we knew at t is equal to zero, how that changes, and we subtract off the things that came in because that was not identified with what was initially there, plus the things that went out. So let's just write that uh, so it's a little bit clearer. So for some property phi, we'd say that dm phi dt in the system representation, that is the stuff that we're tracking uh, all the mass of, is equal to dm phi dt of the control volume plus the stuff that went out of the control volume, so m dot is mass flow rate, minus the stuff that came into the control volume. Okay, so typically we know, for example, what the system description is. So as we said, if phi is equal to the velocity, so we're looking at the momentum, dm phi dt or dm v dt is equal to the sum of the forces. Now, I'm going to just show you sort of the math that takes us from this representation to what we show here um, as the uh, conservation equation or Navier-Stokes. So for a fixed control volume, this term really becomes d dt of the integral of rho, that's the density, phi integrated over the volume. So this is for a particular control volume. And the m dot out is rho 
by velocity dotted with the normal of the control volume integrated over the area. So this is the net flow out. We'll talk about that in more detail. V dot N is positive when V and N, so N again is the normal. to the control volume. So if we have this control volume here, so if we have this control volume, there's a normal that shows up on all surfaces. And the normal is always an outpointing vector from the control surface. When there's flow in, V dot N is negative. When there's flow out, V dot N is positive. So when we look here, we have that net flow out because it's V dot N, if it's, if it's in, V dot N is negative, as you see here, when it's out, V dot N is positive. Now for a fixed control volume, we can take the DDT inside of this uh, integral with respect to the control volume. And so we have the integral over the control volume, d rho phi dt. We use something called Gauss's divergence theorem for this rho phi v dot n, and we get a term, so we integrate this dv, and then we get a term for that, that is the divergence of rho phi v dv. So we turned that area integral into a volume integral. So this was also over the control volume. If we pull both of these because these are both for the control volume together. So we have an integral over the control volume of rho phi dt plus the divergence of rho phi v dv where that dv is over the volume. So this v is the volume, the differential volume. So interestingly enough, we have one more modification that we'd make, and that is we invoke conservation of mass. And we'll talk about what that means in a later discussion. But using that basic rule, we are able to turn the Lagrangian form of Newton's first law into this partial differential equation. And we actually have this partial differential equation for uh, th in three components in general. We have a u or x component, v or y component, w or z component. This u here is the velocity in the x direction. And we call this equation sometimes the X momentum equation. The terms are a transient term which represents storage. These advective terms which represent the flow across the control volume. A pressure gradient term. So these now on the right hand side we have basically the uh, sum of the forces on this control volume. And the sum of the forces are basically a normal force, which is the pressure, and shear forces. So these are the things that deform it on the side. And then there's another type of force, which is a body force, which is uh, this density uh, formulation. If we were to look at how big the different terms are, we would find out that the terms on the left are of magnitude rho u squared L, where u is something called the free stream velocity. So this is the velocity flowing over this object. We find out that the terms over here, these viscous terms, are of magnitude approximately, and this is, there's a, We'll talk later about the fact that this length scale should be modified. This is not really the, the characteristic length of the problem. We'll find out that there's a more appropriate length scale shortly.
But when we look at the uh, some sort of rough estimate of the convective term magnitude versus the viscous term magnitude, what we find out is there is a non-dimensional parameter called the Reynolds number that ties these together. So the Reynolds number is an important parameter in fluid mechanics that relates so-called inertial effects, which are just really the, uh, the flow terms, to viscous effects, which are these shear terms. So when the Reynolds number is very low, this is called low Reynolds number or Stokes flow. It's what uh, sort of traditionally chemical engineers would look at when they're looking at a uh, flow of uh, very small droplets or uh, very small solids in a viscous, very viscous fluid. And then there, for the Reynolds number being large, something called a boundary layer tends to show up. And that boundary layer is an important feature in uh, fluid mechanics and in, in flow analysis, and we'll discuss what that means. Mathematically and otherwise, a boundary layer is a region where the physics of a problem change dramatically. And in fluid mechanics, it's a region near the wall or other surface where the effects of viscosity are most felt. And they're most felt in the sense of enforcing the no-slip condition on the flow. We have boundary layers, both thermal boundary layers and momentum boundary layers. We have chemical species boundary layers. So there are all sorts of different boundary layers that actually evolve in fluid mechanics type problems or fluid mechanics driven problems. So we show here a plate or a wall surface where there's a free stream velocity U infinity and a free stream temperature T infinity. And what we're showing is the growth of the boundary layers over this wall where delta sub t is the thermal boundary layer thickness and delta is the momentum boundary layer thickness. We'll find out that a parameter called the Prandtl number relates the, and this is, it's the Prandtl number is defined in terms of the kinematic viscosity, which is related to the dynamic viscosity over the density to the thermal diffusivity So they're really both diffusivities. You might think in some sense that the kinematic viscosity is a momentum diffusivity of sorts. And so the Prandtl number relates these two and will show that those are related to the thicknesses of the momentum and thermal boundary layers. The boundary layer concept was formally introduced by Prandtl in the early 1900s, around 1904. And, uh, it really affected our ability to understand flows in physical systems like airplanes and, you know, even sort of larger scale, uh, you know, submarines, etc. So without the concept of the boundary layer, there would be really no way to predict frictional drag. So uh, pressure drag is something that has been sort of better known. And it, even in the, it, even, even though uh, pressure drag, you would think, does not require our understanding of the boundary layer, the fact that separation occurs does influence it. So this boundary layer concept has been an important aspect of engineering analysis. Again, the basic idea is that there's a region near the wall where there's a frictional force of sorts or a shear force that's proportional to this shear stress, tau w times an area and for Newtonian fluids, this has this form of the dynamic viscosity times the velocity gradient. The velocity gradient can be approximated as the viscosity times the difference between the free stream velocity, the wall velocity, which is considered zero, divided by the boundary layer thickness. And we'll see that there are different ways of prescribing this boundary layer thickness, but you might think about it in a simple sense as the point where the velocity in the boundary layer or in this near wall region becomes about 99% of the free stream velocity. And not surprisingly, there's an analogy between the, this is not really friction, the shear force on a wall or plate 
and the heat transfer through the plate. And we noted that this shear force is uh, related to tau W, which is related to the viscosity, and the heat, heat transfer rate through the wall is dependent on the heat flux in the area, which is uh, defined in terms of another gradient, which is the temperature gradient times the area. So uh, we see that there is a relationship between these different parameters and, uh, and this get, guides us towards this idea of a heat transfer coefficient. So we've been using this idea of Newton's law of cooling, which is a, a simplification that says that the heat flux is equal to or is proportional to a temperature difference between the wall and the free stream temperature. And that proportionality constant is this heat transfer coefficient. Well, we understand now that this perhaps is not a fundamental uh, parameter and that the fundamental physics of the problem really are defined in terms of the boundary layer thickness and thermal conductivity of the fluid, etc. So the fundamental statement is that that Q wall is defined in K T W minus T infinity over delta T. So in laminar problems, if we just equate these two descriptions, we would find out that the heat transfer coefficient looks like K over delta T. We'll find out that this isn't true for turbulent flows, but it's a reasonable approximation for a laminar flow. We'll also see that there is a parameter called the Nusselt number, which is uh, the heat transfer coefficient times the characteristic length scale divided by the uh, uh, thermal conductivity that will characterize uh, these types of problems. So for a laminar boundary layer, the uh, thermal boundary layer thickness grows like x to the one half. So the thermal boundary layer grows from the leading edge like delta t goes like x to the one half. So if the heat transfer coefficient looks like k over delta t, then h would look like x to the minus one half. So that's not that surprising. So in the uh, near wall region, so there's something else that happens here that we'll explain later, which is that uh, we no longer have a boundary layer form in that nearest wall region because it's really the land scales are small and the influence of the wall is felt upstream in some diffusion length. But we say that the, in this uh, laminar regime, the heat transfer coefficient decays like x to the minus one half, then something happens and it jumps up. The heat transfer coefficient increases suddenly over some distance. And uh, we need to figure out, first of all, how this jump occurs, where it occurs, and what the physics associated with it are. So what do you think causes to happen? A bit of a clue is shown in this diagram or figure uh, at the bottom here. We see that if we're tracking these boundary layers, all of a sudden they go from being nice and smooth to being sort of jagged and mixed. And so if you said that this was a transition to turbulence, you're correct. So transition to turbulence occurs. And that transition process causes flow-induced mixing and an increase in transport in the boundary layer. So experiments show that when the Reynolds number for a flat plate boundary layer is approximately 5 times 10 to the 5, transition to turbulence takes place or to a turbulent flow takes place. And we understand that a boundary layer can be fully turbulent even earlier if it's tripped. So the idea is that if you put some sort of disturbance uh, in that near wall region, you can transition it uh, earlier, but it could re-laminarize. So it could come back to laminar state. Another way for 
inducing turbulence is to have a turbulent free stream. So you can induce turbulence in the free stream and that'll propagate into the boundary layer. So it's this vigorous mixing in this near wall region that we describe in terms of this turbulent flow and all the transport processes are augmented or increased. In the turbulent region, the turbulent boundary layer thickness is set to be a weak function of x. It's x to the four-fifths, so the boundary layer thickness grows like x to the four-fifths. Oftentimes people say that it's, it's basically uh, linear. Um, and the heat transfer coefficient in the turbulent regime uh, decays like x to the minus one-fifth. And remember what we said, that h does not look like k over delta t in the turbulent regime. So we no longer can use that sort of simple laminar argument there.